welcome you to be uh, here for Dr. Stallman's talk. Turns out that I'm teaching a computer course called C and Unix course every, every, every year, every other year. And this year I had a non-computer science student in it called Jay. And as it turned out that Jay mentioned the idea of bringing Dr. Stallman. He asked me if, I, if I've heard about Richard Stallman. And I said, yes, of course I have. And then he said, would it be okay if you could get him over here for a talk? And I thought, well, that would be, that would be very cool. So uh, I didn't think it would happen, but it happened. It worked out, everything worked out. So we were very glad to have Dr. Stallman here today. But let me introduce Jay, the student that uh, made it all happen. And he's going to introduce Dr. Stallman then. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, so here we have Dr. Richard Stallman. He's the recipient of numerous awards. He's a MacArthur uh, Foundation Fellowship recipient and a Grace Hopper Murray Award Yes, <laughs> from the Association for Computing Machinery. He holds several honorary doctorates, among others, the Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden, the University of Glasgow, UK, and the Universidad Nacional uh, de Ingeria, uh, Ingeria, uh, Peru, uh, and Lakehead University, Canada. <laughs> he launched the GNU project to create a free, excuse me, GNU. Uh, to, uh, to create a free Unix-like operating system, and has been the project's lead architect and organizer. He also founded the Free Software Foundation to promote the universal freedom to create, distribute, and modify computer software. Stallman has written many essays on software freedom and is an outspoken political campaigner for the free software movement. <clears throat> He played a major role in the evolution of GNU Linux operating system. Uh, no, sorry. Um, he played, uh, and without the GNU, GPL, uh, Wikipedia, and other high profile projects would not be possible. I can say for one, actually, I might not have made it uh, through college without some of your contribute, uh, contributions to society. So thank you. You're very welcome. Without further ado, Dr. Stallman. So when you owe something important to free software, you should pay it forward, contribute to the community. Now, this is not a talk about free software. This talk responds to a question people used to ask me at the end of a talk about free software. So to make it make sense, I better start by briefly explaining the idea of free software. Free software is software that respects your freedom and respects your community. So it's free as in freedom. We are not talking about price. Price is just a minor detail, which is not the issue. So to understand the term free as used in free software, think of free speech not free beer. When a program is not free, we call it non-free software, proprietary software, user subjugating software, because those programs establish a system of electronic colonization. A non-free program keeps its users divided and helpless, divide and rule, that's what colonial systems do. The users are divided because they're forbidden to redistribute it, and they're helpless because they don't have the source code, so they can't change it. They can't even tell what it's really doing to them. And often these programs have malicious features. I'll tell you about some of them today. But it's very general to say the program respects your freedom and community. In order for this to be meaningful, I'd better say something more specific. A program is free software if you, the user, have the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. There are proprietary programs that come with nasty restrictive licenses that don't even let you do that much. Then there's freedom one, the freedom to study the source code and change it 
so the program does your computing as you wish. Then freedom two is the freedom to help others. That's the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program to others when you wish, which includes making the copies that you're going to distribute. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. I want, so what these four freedoms add up to is that the users control the program. With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. The first case is free software. When the users have sufficient freedom to effectively control the program, then the program respects their freedom because they, they take advantage of those freedoms to have control over what they're doing with the program. But if the users don't have enough freedom to effectively have control of the program, then the program controls the users and the developer controls the program. So the program is an instrument giving one entity control over the users of that program. It's an instrument of unjust power. It's a yoke. So that software is unethical. It should not exist. And the goal of the free software movement is to get rid of it. First of all, from our lives, and hopefully someday from the world. There should not be any proprietary software. <clears throat> because you, software users, deserve freedom. Now, to make free software a real possibility, we needed to have a sufficient collection of free software that you could run a computer that way and do the usual things with it. In 1983, when I decided to do this, it was impossible to get a new computer and run it in freedom. They all needed an operating system the computer won't do anything without an operating system, which is a collection of many programs that do the usual jobs and provide the base for implementing other jobs. And in 1983, all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary. So if you bought a computer to make it useful, you had to have a proprietary operating system installed in it, and there went your freedom. So I wanted to change this, so I decided to operating system. And I decided to make it compatible with the Unix operating system. First of all, because that way it could be a portable system that could run on future computer models that would be different from the computer models of that day. And second, because that way a lot of people would already know how to use it. That is, all the Unix users would know how to use my system as soon as it was done, if I made it compatible with Unix. And then I gave it the name GNU as a joke. GNU, which is spelled G-N-U, is a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix, which is a humorous way of giving credit for the technical ideas borrowed from Unix. We couldn't use any of the code of Unix because that was proprietary software. But we got technical ideas from it, and this is a way of recognizing that, a humorous way. But why GNU and not SNU, UNU, ANU? Because those are not words. GNU is a word. It's the name of that animal that lives in Africa, and of course, without a second meaning, it's not a joke. But even better, GNU is the most humor-charged word in the English language used in countless word plays. Because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So every time you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U, and you've got a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke, but there are lots of them. So when people see that word, they're already almost ready to laugh. Given a meaningful, specific reason to use this as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. 
but when it's the name of our system, please pronounce it with a hard G. Pronounce it GNU. If you call it the new operating system, you will get people confused because you'll be stating an untruth. You see, we've been working on it for 27 years now, and we've been using it more or less for 19 years, which means it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU, so be careful to pron pronounce the name GNU and avoid the various erroneous pronunciations such as new and Linux. When people say, when people say they're running Linux, they're really talking about the GNU system together with Linux, which is one important piece of the system as we use it. So uh, there's enough credit to share, but we should get some of it. Please call the system GNU plus Linux or GNU slash Linux and give us equal mention. Now, if this were a talk about free software, I'd go on to explain why those four freedoms are essential. But instead, I want to address the follow-on question. People would ask me, do these same ideas apply to anything else other than software? Oh, before I finish, I, before I move on, I should mention that schools, including universities, ethically must teach only free software. And there are many reasons for this. One of them is because the schools have a social mission to educate good citizens of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society. And in computing, that means teaching the use of free software. Why do some proprietary software developers offer gratis copies of their non-free software to schools? They want to use the schools as an instrument to impose on society a dependence on their proprietary product. Here's how it works. They provide these gratis copies to the schools. The schools teach the students to use them, and the students become dependent. And then they graduate, and they're still dependent. And those same companies don't offer those ex-students gratis copies. Oh, no. And these ex-students, well, in the past, they used to go to work for companies. Maybe that won't happen anymore in our uh, right-wing imposed future with these uh, free exploitation treaties, every one of which is designed to attack and weaken democracy. But maybe some will still get jobs and work for companies. Well, the developer won't offer those companies gratis copies. The idea is that the school di directs the students down the path of permanent dependence and they can pull the rest of society along with them into dependence. It's like giving the school gratis needles full of addictive drugs, saying, inject these into your students to make them dependent. The first dose is gratis. Once you're dependent, then you have to pay. The schools, with their social mission, must never do this. Whether this proprietary software is gratis or not, they must not teach people to use it. They've got to educate and graduate free software users ready to be part of a free society. But there is also a reason for education, for the education of the best programmers. There are natural born programmers and when they get to be 10 to 13, they're fascinated with software and computing. They want to know how everything works. But when they ask the teacher, how does this program work? If it's proprietary, the teacher can only say, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to find out. It's a secret. And thus, education is not allowed in that school. But if the program is free, the teacher can explain as much as he knows and then say, here's the source code. Read it and you'll understand everything. 
and they will read it because they're fascinated and they yearn to understand. So that gives them the chance to learn a very important lesson because the teacher can say, if you come across any point you can't figure it out, show it to me and we'll figure it out together. And that way, our natural born programmer can learn that that code is not clean. You shouldn't write it that way. That's an example of how not to do things. If even these natural born programmers, who tend to be pretty clever, can't figure out that code, that's really unclear. How do you learn to write good, clear code? By reading lots of code and writing lots of code. You see, a natural born programmer can write code in many ways that runs correctly, but other people won't be able to figure out why. And that's not good code. So learning to write good, clear code means learning to understand all the things that you shouldn't do because other people would have trouble understanding them. So you have to read lots of code. Only free software offers the opportunity to read lots of code of large programs that we really use. And then you have to write lots of code. And assuming you're going to write code for large programs, you need to, to learn to do that. You need to start small. But that doesn't mean small programs. The challenges of large programs don't even begin to appear in small programs. So you're not starting even if you write small programs. You have to start small for this means writing small changes in the code of large programs. And only free software gives you the opportunity to write small changes in existing large programs that really work and are really used. That's how I learned to be a good programmer. And today, any school can offer this opportunity provided it's a free software school. But there is an even deeper reason for moral education, education and citizenship. Every school must teach not just facts and skills, but above all, the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping others. Therefore, every class must have this rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with everyone else in the class, including the source code in case someone here would like to learn because this class is a place for sharing knowledge. In order to set a good example, the school has to follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and share copies with all the students. Now, some people advocate teaching proprietary software as well in school so people will know them both. That's like saying that the school lunch should offer water and whiskey so that the students will get used to them both. Uh, I think schools should teach good habits, not bad ones. So, <clears throat> the, so schools should not be teaching dependence that will be exploited by someone else. And therefore, Schools must get rid of their proprietary software and move to free software, including this one. Those of you who have a relationship with this school or any other, it's your responsibility to campaign for the school to migrate to free software. I wouldn't recommend trying to migrate in a week. It takes time to do it to avoid creating unnecessary difficulties but it can be done in several years. What it mainly requires is moral fir firmness. And by raising this always as a moral issue, you can launch the campaign that eventually will make the school migrate. You'll have to keep pushing and keep looking for different opportunities to push in different ways. Don't get stuck on one path to the point that you can't see other doorways. Keep looking for more allies. Keep pushing in a way that others will hear about so that they might join. 
So now I'm ready to move on to the follow-on question, whether these ideas apply to anything other than software, and specifically whether they apply to published works of other kinds that are not software packages, that aren't programs. Well, if you have a copy of something that's not a program, almost always the only thing that restricts what you can do with it is copyright law. So we can ask the same question from the other side by saying, what should copyright law say about what you can do with it? Now, copyright has had a history which is connected with the history of copying technology. So it's useful to look at them together as a background for this question. Changes in technology can't affect basic moral principles. Those are too deep. But when we apply our principles to most questions of right and wrong, we do it by looking at the consequences of various things we might do and then judging those consequences. A change in the context can alter the consequences of a particular act and make it more good or more bad than it was before. And that can change our conclusion. For instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, then murder wouldn't be so serious. The judge would say, you killed him, you have to pay for his new body. Bang. Uh, and in the US, we would all need uninsured murderer insurance, but in civilized countries, the National Health Service would pay for that. So, Let's look at the history of copying technology. Copying began in the ancient world where it was done with a writing instrument on a writing surface. You would read one copy and you'd write another copy of the same text. This technology was very slow, but it had certain other interesting characteristics. First of all, there was no economy of scale to make 10 copies would take you 10 times as long as making one copy. Second, it required no special equipment other than the equipment for reading and writing. Third, it required no particular skill other than literacy itself. This resulted in a decentralized production of copies. Anywhere that there was one copy and somebody wanted to make another, he would do so. There was nothing like copyright in the ancient world. If you had a copy of a book and you wanted to make another, no one would try to stop you or claim that you weren't allowed to, except in the case where the local potentate didn't like the book, in which case he might do horrible things to you, which was not copyright, but something closely related, namely censorship. That went on for thousands of years, but then there was a great advance in copying technology, the printing press, which made copying more efficient, but not uniformly more efficient. In the ancient world, making many copies and making one copy were equally inefficient. With the printing press, making many copies became far more efficient, but one-off copying did not benefit. In fact, it was faster to write a copy than to make one copy with the printing press. In addition, well, the reason for this is that printing had an economy of scale. It took a long time to set the type for a page, but once that was done, you could quickly make many identical copies much faster than writing them. In addition, the printing press and the type were expensive equipment that most literate people did not own. And 
they didn't know how to use them either. Because running a press was a very different skill from reading and writing. The result was centralized production of copies. Copies of any given book were made in a few places, and then they were transported to where somebody might want to buy them. In the first few centuries of printing, a large fraction of all copies of books were still made by hand. Either they were made for rich people, to show how rich they were, or they were made by poor people, because as the song goes, time ain't money if all you got is time. <clears throat> so hand copying continued, but gradually printed copying uh, became the usual case. Copyright began in the age of the printing press. Copyright in England was instituted in 1557, I believe, as a system of censorship, specifically censorship of Protestants. In order to be allowed to publish a book, one was required to ask the state for approval of the book. The approval was granted as a perpetual monopoly to one publisher. This system of censorship was allowed to lapse in the, in the 1680s, and then the publishers demanded their monopoly back, but what they got in the Statute of Anne was something different. Namely, copyright was established as a monopoly for the author, but for a limited time, I think it was 14 years renewable once. And the idea developed that copyright would be a system of encouraging and facilitating authorship. When the US Constitution was written, there was a proposal to uh, say that authors were entitled to a copyright. This was rejected. Instead, the Constitution says, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by reserving to authors and inventors for a limited time the exclusive use of their respective writings and discoveries. Now, this sentence says, makes three important points about copyright. And by the way, this one sentence also applies to patent law, and this one sentence is the sum total of what copyright law and patent law have in common. Everything else is totally different. So as a whole, those two laws have nothing in common and in practice and have to be thought of as totally different issues. In this talk, I'm talking only about copyright law. <clears throat> So, first of all, the Constitution does not require copyright. There is no constitutional right of authors to have any sort of such power because it only says Congress shall have the power to do this. It doesn't say Congress shall. Second, copyright has to last for a limited time. <clears throat> well, and, well, actually, second, it's... If there is to be a copyright system, its motive, its purpose is to promote progress. It's not justified by any benefits that authors, let alone publishers, hope to get. It's not for their sake at all. They're not entitled to any of this. It's behavior modification. The goal is promoting progress, which is a benefit for the public, not for authors in particular. And third, it has to last for a limited time. Ever since this decision was made, publishers have been trying to get us to forget that it was made. But in the age of the printing press, copyright functioned as an industrial regulation, regulating publishers under the control of authors, but in a system set up to provide benefit to the general public. 
Because of this, copyright was mostly uncontroversial, easy to enforce, and arguably beneficial. It was uncontroversial because it didn't restrict anybody but publishers. So if you weren't a publisher, you had no occasion to complain. It was easy to enforce because it only had to be enforced against publishers. And it's easy to do that. It's easy to find out who's publishing a book. You don't need to invade everybody's home, everybody's computer, and everybody's network connection. And finally, it was arguably beneficial because according to the US legal philosophy of copyright, the public had made a trade. Part of the public's natural right to copy anything, the public had traded away in, ex in exchange for more progress, more writing. And this trade was okay because the public was not in a position to exercise this freedom. If you weren't a publisher, you couldn't really copy, except by hand. But nobody ever expected copyright law to apply to hand copying. In fact, the, US, the first US copyright law didn't cover hand copying. It covered printing and publication. Everyone understood it was supposed to be an industrial regulation, not a restriction on ordinary citizens who could read but had no printing presses. So, arguably it was beneficial. The government on our behalf traded away a natural right we couldn't exercise, which so it was directly of no value to us. And if in exchange we got something of some value, at least it was a positive deal. However, well, and, and so if we were still in the age of the printing press, I don't think I'd be criticizing copyright law. I wouldn't be giving a speech like this. But the age of the printing press is gradually giving way to the age of the computer networks. Another advance in copying technology that makes it easier to copy and manipulate information. <clears throat> The result of this is another improvement in the efficiency of copying. Here's where we were in the age of the printing press. Mass production, very efficient. One-off copying, still about the way it was in uh, the ancient world. Uh, during the 1800s, printing presses were mechanized and mass production copying got even more efficient and hand copying mostly stopped. Even poor people could buy a book. Perhaps they would buy a book with a cheap cover made out of paper. Uh, but it, the result was people forgot about the idea that it would be useful to copy books by hand. Uh, but in any case, there was no particular attempt to enforce copyright law against hand copiers in as long as the age of the printing press went on. But now we have another advance that, of digital technology that brings us here. Another, again, making copying more efficient and not uniformly so. It's one-off copying that benefits the most. And it becomes almost as efficient as mass production copying. It may not be perfectly equally efficient, for instance, mass-produced CDs are cheaper than one-off CDs, but one-off CDs are cheap enough that hundreds of millions of people can make them and do. So uh, we are now in a situation more like the ancient world, where anybody who could have a copy can also copy it. The result is that the same copyright law has an effect which is totally different. It no longer operates as an industrial regulation on publishers, 
controlled by the authors and set up to benefit the public. Now it's an intolerable restriction on the general public controlled principally by the publishers in the name of the authors. As a result, it is no longer uncontroversial. It now restricts every member of society and people are forming political parties to fight against it. And it's no longer easy to enforce because enforcing this against every citizen requires draconian manners methods and often involves discarding basic concepts of justice. And it's not beneficial because those natural rights that were traded away on our behalf because we couldn't exercise them now are possible for us to exercise. We want to exercise them and we demand to be allowed to do so. And thus the government that continues to forbid us to exercise these rights declares itself a public enemy. Under these circumstances, a government that represents the people would say, although in the past it was okay to trade away these natural rights of the public that they couldn't exercise, it's not okay anymore. So we've got to put an end to that. We've got to gain back those, we've got to re recover those rights and give them back to the public. We've got to reduce copyright power. We can measure the sickness of democracy around the world by the tendency of governments to do the exact opposite. They are extending copyright power when they should be reducing it. For instance, there's the dimension of time. When the US copyright law was first set up, I believe copyright lasted 28 years and could be renewed once. Well, that's already a pretty long time, but it has been extended over and over. The last time was in 1998. Copyright was extended 20 years on both past works and future works. Now how they could encourage the writing of works in the past by extending the copyright on those past works is beyond me. They would need a time machine. And if they have one, they haven't used it. Because our history books don't record that in the 1920s, as authors found out that their copyrights would get extended by 20 more years in 1998, they it, that they set to work with renewed vigor. Why don't they use their time machine and get us more beloved classics? Extending the copyright on future works yet to be written, you'll notice I don't like to use the word create in this context. That's propaganda, I believe, designed to make us think of authors as semi-divine and deserving special privilege over us mortals. And I reject that. I stand with the US Constitution in regard to the basic idea of copyright. So I won't call them creators. <clears throat> in any case, Extending copyright on future works could conceivably increase the motivation, the extrinsic motivation to make those works, but not for anybody rational. Because economists will, as economists will tell you, the discounted present value of 20 more years of copyright starting 50 years after your death is so small that it won't have a rational influence on any decision you would make about whether to write something. And if any companies claim that 75 years of copyright for a work made as a job by employees was not enough, that they needed 95 years, we should have challenged them to present their projected balance sheets for 75 years in the future to prove that this was true. Of course, they don't have projected balance sheets so far in the future. Everything they said about the reasons for that law were bogus lip service 
to the principles that copyright is supposed to exist for. <clears throat> the real reason for that law is that companies which had lucrative monopolies wanted, that were scheduled to expire, did not want them to expire. For instance, Disney was aware that the copyright on the image of Mickey Mouse would expire uh, along with the copyright of the first film in which Mickey Mouse appeared. Now, Disney has obtained a great deal from the public domain and is firmly resolved never to contribute anything back. So Disney paid for an extension of copyrights. We refer to that law typically as the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act. <clears throat> so they got 20 more years However, what the movie companies want is perpetual copyright. They can't explicitly propose this because they don't have enough power yet to amend the US Constitution. But their plan is perpetual copyright on the installment plan. Every 20 years, extend it 20 more years. This way, at any given time, if you point at any given work, there's a date when it's supposedly going to go into the public domain. But don't hold your breath because that date is like tomorrow, it never comes. By the time you reach that date, their plan is to have postponed it again. So around 2018, we can expect them to try again to extend copyrights. And we're going to have to fight to stop them. <clears throat> this copyright extension wave is being pushed around the world. They're now trying it in Canada. But meanwhile, Mexico has gone far beyond the US. In Mexico, they've extended copyright till 100 years after the author's death. I guess the principle is that the great, 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 great grandchildren of the author are entitled to an income. Uh, which apparently they don't do for any other profession. <clears throat> well, the dimension of time is important, but the dimension of breadth is even more important. Which uses of the work are covered by copyright? In the age of the printing press, copyright was never supposed to cover all uses of a copyrighted work. There were certain uses of the work that were covered by copyright, but those were the exception in a broader space of free, unrestricted use. However, the publishers have got the idea that they can use digital, digital technology to impose a pay-per-view universe on the public. And the way they do this is by turning our technology against us through malicious features in our own devices, generally known as digital handcuffs or DRM, digital restrictions management. So, <clears throat> digital restrictions management means designing players so that they don't let you do things you might want to do. In other words, it means designing the technology to be your prison guard instead of your servant. Generally, this is done using non-free software. The reason is, if it were done in free software, well, with free software, the users control the program. If it were designed such that it was incapable of doing something users wanted to do, users would change it. That's what users do when their freedom is respected. 
So anyone whose goal is to stop users from doing things, to control the users, has to have recourse to non-free software. So their purpose is to attack users' freedom. That's one evil. But in order to make it stick, they need to attack users' freedom at a deeper level with non-free software, software not controlled by the users. So it's generally two evils together. The public first encountered this. Oh, and this is an example of a malicious feature. I told you that malicious features are common in proprietary software. There are generally three kinds. There are the spy features called spyware. Uh, there are these digital handcuffs. And there are back doors. And they're all quite common. For instance, one proprietary package that has all three that you might have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. It's malware. One backdoor in Windows gives Microsoft the power to forcibly impose software changes without asking permission of the nominal owner of the computer. I say nominal because given this backdoor, once Microsoft has Windows running in that machine, Microsoft has owned that computer. So Windows is universal malware. Any malicious feature that's not in Windows today could be installed through this backdoor tomorrow. So uh, you mustn't use Windows. Uh, <clears throat> of course, the Macintosh also has digital handcuffs. And the newer Apple products, the iGrown and the iBad, go even further. Apple has taken control over installation of applications. So you're not even free to install the programs of your choice unless you manage to find a way to break that, th those chains, which is known as jailbreaking, which recognizes that those products are jails. If you've got one of them, throw it away. <clears throat> Another good example is Adobe Flash Player, which is a proprietary program distributed gratis. But gratis doesn't mean it's free software, because that's a matter of freedom. And the users do not have control over Flash Player. And it has malicious features for surveillance and digital handcuffs. So if you made the mistake of installing Flash Player because it was gratis, delete it. Sure, Adobe doesn't make the users pay to be abused, but that doesn't mean you should let them do it. <clears throat> In any case, users first generally encountered digital handcuffs with DVDs. DVDs are designed to have the video encrypted in a format that originally was secret for the specific purpose of restricting the public. And for a while it worked. The DVD conspiracy set up its rules saying that anyone who wanted to manufacture DVD players had to join the conspiracy and promise to keep the format a secret and to build their DVD players to restrict the users just like all the other DVD players. This is why, despite so many different manufacturers, none was really any better than any others. <clears throat> and then, uh, then some people figured out the format. And they wrote a free program capable of decoding this encryption. So you could actually buy a DVD and play it in freedom with free software. The movie companies didn't like that, so they purchased a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 1998. And the, uh, <clears throat> what this law did was it banned free software capable of breaking digital handcuffs. 
and any, actually anything capable of digi breaking digital handcuffs. What they said was, they're on the side of Hollywood and against us. And other countries have since adopted similar laws, usually under pressure from the US or corruptly lobbied by uh, the movie and record companies. I don't have a copy of that program because I often go to France. And in France, the possession of a copy of this program is an offense punished by imprisonment. So I prefer simply to have no way to view an encrypted DVD. I don't have any, I don't use any, I, I have no way to view them, and I'm happy with that. I don't like the companies that corrupted my government and purchased this law. I don't want to give them any money. So in general, I don't see many movies except in airplanes. So, so uh, despite this law, it remains easy to find this software. So the movie companies tried another approach. They developed another form of encryption that they figured uh, would be impossible to break called AACS. The AACS conspiracy is quite arrogant. For instance, as of either this year or 2013, I forget which, they dictated that analog video outputs are prohibited. That's how powerful they are. They can impose requirements like that. <clears throat> And they figured that AACS would never be broken. AACS was used in HD DVD and is used in Blu-ray discs. But in fact, it was broken. Somebody published a free program that could do Blu-ray decryption, but it was useless. Without knowing the key, you couldn't actually run it. And then I saw a photo of two adorable puppies with 32 hex digits above them. And I wondered why put those hex digits in an image with the puppies? Could these be a key of some that's important and that our government wants to forbid uh, and that someone put it together, the digits together with the puppies figuring people will save the image because the puppies are so cute and that will protect this number from censorship, that's what it was. That number was the key to break the ax, which is what I sometimes call AACS. But it didn't do that much good because they changed the key. They've got something set up to change the key every few months. So, Uh, it was uh, a nice victory to talk about, but it didn't defeat Blu-ray. And there's another level of digital restrictions management in Blu-ray, which they change also totally every few months. And it's, it seems hopeless to try to catch up with that. So you've got to regard Blu-ray discs as guns pointed at you. Never use a Blu-ray disc. Never use any product designed to attack your freedom unless you personally have the means to thwart the attack. Don't be the kind of fool who surrenders freedom for convenience. Because in a world of people like that, we end up with no freedom. Now, it's possible that Blu-ray has been sort of broken 
because someone totally broke the security of the PlayStation 3. And so it may be that that's now a way to read all Blu-ray discs and get the material out without restriction. I'm not sure. It might be. Maybe that's the, maybe that's a way, an acceptable way to access Blu-ray discs. If you're going to do it that way, I won't say it's wrong. But if it's not that, which you're going to do, then you mustn't. Well, we've also seen digital restrictions management in music. Around 10 years ago, we started to see things that looked like compact discs, but were not written according to the standards for compact discs. So we called them corrupt discs. The idea was that they would play in an audio player, but would not be readable in a computer. So we had to do things to make lists of these corrupt discs and warn people not to buy them. But in some countries, it was easier because uh, they were not allowed to put the compact disc logo on them since they didn't satisfy the specs. So they had to call them something else. And uh, I was once given by my speech hosts a disc of music from their region. And I wanted to open it and listen to it. But fortunately, before I broke the seal, I saw the symbol copy control. This disc can be played in Windows and Macintosh systems, meaning not with free software. So I gave it back to them and I said, here you see the face of the enemy. Please take this back to the store because they don't deserve to keep your money. So you see what the danger is. Sony came up with a really clever scheme for corrupt disks. Their idea was, instead of distorting the way the tracks were written, they would put a program onto the disk such that if you put the disk into a computer, that program would execute and it would, without asking permission, it would alter the operating system. It altered the operating system, putting in code to restrict what you could do with the music on those disks. In addition, it altered the system, changing a command you would use to investigate what's in the system to hide the presence of that same software. And it also changed the command you could use normally to delete it, so that if you tried to delete that stuff, it would do nothing. This, is, this program, which took control of your computer, is known as a rootkit. It's the same thing that a cracker would use to try to take control of a computer or that some viruses might use. And this was a felony. But it's not the only felony Sony committed because some of that code was taken from a program released under the GNU General Public License. Now, the GNU General Public License is a free software license. It gives users the four freedoms. But it's a special kind of free software license. It's a copyleft license. And copyleft means that when you redistribute, when you use some of that code in another program, the other program has to be under the same license. And when you distribute copies of that other program, you have to make the source code available and give the users a copy of the license so they know their rights. Sony didn't do that. And thanks to laws that Sony helped purchase, commercial copyright infringement is a felony also. Two felonies in these corrupt disks, but Sony was not prosecuted. You see, our officials understand perfectly that the purpose of the laws is to establish power for corporations over us, not to defend our rights. However, people who had been victimized by these disks sued Sony. Unfortunately, they focused their condemnation not on the malicious purpose of this malfeature, but rather on all the other nasty things Sony did as means toward its evil end. As a result, Sony was able to settle these lawsuits by promising 
that in the future when it designs technology to attack our freedom, it won't do the other things. And Sony learned its lesson because <clears throat> in the future, the rootkit will be built into the computer before you get it and, it's, and they will try to make it absolutely impossible to remove. And it will be AACS and the computer will be the PlayStation 3, which, in which Sony tried to make it absolutely impossible and was so nasty as to release as to force users to choose to give up either one half of the features of the machine or the other half. They bought the machine thinking it could do these things, and then Sony told them, here's an upgrade. If you don't install the upgrade, these things will stop working, and if you do, these things will stop working. And there are people suing Sony for that. And then last fall, somebody figured out things completely and uh, p released information on how to totally break the security of that machine. That is, the security that it imposes on its users, not their protection, not to protect the users, but to re control them. It's like the security of a prison. Anyway, it's been broken, and Sony sent the police after the person who did it. This shows how closely our treacherous government is allied to these companies against us. Now, Apple started distributing music with DRM over the internet. And then the record companies found that their deal with Apple was giving them the short end of the stick. Apple was in the driver's seat. They wanted another way to distribute music that didn't involve Apple, but their contract said that they couldn't sell it with DRM anywhere else. So they tried selling music downloads without DRM, and lo and behold, the sky didn't fall on them. So they kept doing it more, and eventually Apple decided to drop the DRM too. So you could say Apple was responsible for the availability of non-DRM music on the net, but uh, not in, it didn't intentionally do this. It was unintentionally responsible and doesn't deserve any credit. And so DRM mostly disappeared in the area of music, but it's trying to make a comeback now with various streaming services where they say, run this non-free program and listen to music whenever you like, but you can't save the music. Why not? Well, they pretend that that's a natural consequence of the fact that it's streaming, but really it's just an arbitrary restriction that they decided to put in. To save that data would be the easiest thing in the world. So why is it you have to listen with a special non-free program? Of course, you should never run a non-free program. They're taking away your freedom. But the reason they make it non-free is to impose this restriction. If it were free, someone would fix it. So we've got to recognize that these screaming services are DRM also. And the most successful one, Spotify, just modified its rules and said we're, that they're going to limit how much time people can spend listening to the music gratisly streamed. So it shows they've always got power. You shouldn't let them have that power. Anyway, we've also seen DRM in books. This first was attempted 10 years ago. There was a coordinated worldwide PR campaign to encourage ebooks to convince us that we were all going to love ebooks we will all be reading ebooks soon and then the publishers decided to launch their lines and one publisher had the idea that it could get its encrypted user restricting ebooks started with a bang among technophiles and new and early adopters 
if it started with a biography of me. So the publisher found an author and sent him to me. He asked for my cooperation, and I said, only if this ebook will be available without encryption and people will be free to share it. The publisher said no, and I said no. And then a few months later, we found another publisher who wanted to publish it on paper and was willing to publish the uh, text online and let people share it. In fact, the book was published under a free license, under the GNU free documentation license, which I wrote initially for, the use, for use in manuals but you could use it in any kind of book. So it sold f for several years on, on paper, and then they stopped. And uh, the Free Software Foundation has now come out with a revised edition, which is a semi-autobiography. It has my point of view and Sam Williams's point of view uh, in lots of places labeled, so you can contrast them. And there are copies back there. If you buy one, I'll sign it. Anyway. Ebooks mostly flopped 10 years ago. People just didn't like them. And it sure would have been nice to believe that this was because people appreciated freedom and wouldn't give up their freedom for ebooks. But I said, we shouldn't assume that. They'll try again. We have to get ready now to fight them. And yes, they're back with products like the Sony Shredder and the Barnes & Noble Schnook and the Amazon Swindle. Now these products are designed to attack the traditional freedoms of readers. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously, paying cash. You can't do that for the Swindle because most books, the, the, the most important recent books are all available only from Amazon. And the only, and Amazon makes the customers identify themselves. So it's impossible to get those books anonymously in any lawful way. So you've got to choose the lawful way or the ethical way. Uh, if you can find an ethical way. So the result of this is that Amazon maintains a giant list of all the books each user has read. Now such a list is a threat to human rights and it must not be allowed to exist anywhere. We need not raise the question of whether Amazon in particular can deserve so much trust that we could allow it to have this list. Because nobody could possibly deserve that much trust. There's no place we can allow this list to exist. Then there's the freedom to give, lend, or sell a book to someone else. Amazon takes this away using digital restrictions management features and through total contempt for private property because Amazon says you're not allowed to own a book. Amazon says, that you can't buy books for the swindle. All you can do is get the license to read one under Amazon's conditions. Now, this is an attack on society. Imagine if you visit your friend and there are no books there. And it's not because your friend is a non-reader. Rather, all your friend's books are in a device and for him to lend you a book, he'd have to lend you his whole library, which is obviously too much to ask of anyone. So, the use of the swindle or comparable devices is the end of friendship among people who read. Make sure your friends know this. Make sure your relatives know this. Make sure they know that they shouldn't buy you one of these malicious products as a present. In December, the Free Software Foundation warns people, tell the people you know not to get you these malicious things as a present. Make sure you've warned your friends before they think of using these devices. Because 
after they pay money to get one, they may be too attached to the money already spent to give up. But if you warn them in advance, if you say, think about whether you want to break off all your friendships with people who read before you get that device, maybe they won't. <clears throat> so that's where we stand, basically, with, oh, there's a third freedom that, boy, I'm too sleepy today. There's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish and read it as many times as you wish and perhaps pass it on to your heirs. Amazon takes this away with a back door in the swindle. We know about this back door by observation. In 2009, various users observed the fact that Amazon remotely deleted thousands of copies of a particular book. Some people saw it, said the book disappeared as they were in the middle of reading it, and so did all the notes they had put in about the book at the same time. And these were authorized copies that they had, they had been obtained directly by, from Amazon, so Amazon knew exactly where they were. And <clears throat> the book with which Amazon demonstrated the Orwellian nature of its product was 1984 by George Orwell. After the bad publicity, Amazon said, we'll never do this again unless ordered to by the state. Very comforting, eh? In Canada, the author and publisher of the Harry Potter books got an injunction against people tell, who had bought the books, ordering them not to read them. A bookstore put the books on sale before the date they were supposed to be available. And people came in and said, oh great, I'll buy it. And then the author was so, uh, so, insanely possessive that she got an injunction ordering those people not to read their books. I responded to this with a boycott of Harry Potter books. I don't say you shouldn't read them. That I leave to the author. I just say you shouldn't buy them. So if you want to read them, borrow a copy. In any case, that's the sort of situation where Amazon would remotely delete them, forcibly remotely delete them. So you mustn't go along with this, and I never will. So this is where we stand with DRM today, and this completes the picture of what treacherous governments have been doing to our freedom for the sake of those corporations, the corporations that they really work for. But if in some country there is government of the people, by the people, for the people, instead of for the corporations, what would it do about copyright? It would reduce copyright power, not necessarily eliminate it, but reduce it. So, here are my recommendations. First, time. Copyright should last a much shorter time. I recommend 10 years starting from the date of publication. Why from the date of publication? Because before the book is published, we don't have copies, so it makes no difference to us whether we'd be allowed to copy the copies we don't have. We might as well let the author have as long as it takes to arrange publication and then start the clock. Why 10 years? Because the usual publication cycle is much shorter than that. It's three years. Almost all books published in the US are remaindered within two years and out of print within three. So, 
10 years is more than three times the usual publication cycle. It seems comfortably long. However, not everyone agrees with that. I once proposed these same things in a panel discussion with fiction writers, and an award-winning fantasy writer on the panel said, 10 years, that's horrible. Anything more than five is intolerable. I was surprised. Until that moment, I had been fooled by the publishers. When the publishers demand increased power over us, they say it's in the name of the artists. And they will bring out a few very well-known star artists who say, yes, I want more copyright power too. And those are the only ones who do. The other artists, almost all of them, who were not stars, the companies are grinding them into the ground with their heels. But we don't usually hear about them. This award-winning writer, however, was not a big seller. And it seemed that his books had gone out of print. And his contract said that if his books went out of print, the rights would revert to him. He wanted to distribute copies of his own books to his fans so they could read them. But the publisher said no. The publisher refused to acknowledge that the books were out of print and was using the copyright on his own work to stop him from distributing copies. Now, he wanted people to have a chance to appreciate his work. Just about all artists start out publishing their work so people will appreciate it. And a tiny fraction get very rich and the money corrupts them. So they want the money more than they want the appreciation. But for practically all of them, they never get enough money to corrupt them and they go on wanting the same thing, people to appreciate their work. He knew that for more than five years of copyright was not likely to do him good and could do him harm. So he said, no more than five. Well, when I say 10, I'm not insisting on 10, no more, no less. I'm making a suggestion for a first adjustment. I'm not saying 10 is exactly the right number, but if we try 10 years and we let a decade or two go by, then we might decide to adjust it. I just think that that's roughly right. And if everyone else wanted five years, I wouldn't object. However, moving from the dimension of time to the dimension of breadth, which uses should copyright cover? For this, I distinguish three broad categories of works. There are the works that you use to do a practical job. There are the works that say what certain people thought or think. And there are the works of art and entertainment whose contribution is in the impact of the work. So these are three different kinds of contribution to society. And I have a different conclusion according to the kind of contribution the work makes. First of all, there are the works there are, that do a practical job. I call them functional works. This does not mean that there are no aesthetic elements in writing these works, but rather it means that what we appreciate them for is not mainly their aesthetic elements, it's the jobs they do. These include computer programs, recipes, educational works, reference works, text fonts, and other things you could think of. Works whose, which are prized because of the jobs you can do with them. These works must be free. In order to, because if you use the work to do something in your life, if you don't control the work, you don't control your life. Freedom is having control of your own life. So you must be free to, to adjust the work and change it to do the job you want to do. But once you've done that, it's important for society that you be free to publish your version because there will be others who would appreciate it, people who want to do the same job you want to do. Or maybe your version is just better at the original job. 
Either way, you've got to be free to publish it to make it available to them. And as long as commercial publication remains a useful thing, your version has got to be commercially publishable also. But it's absurd to permit publication of modified versions and forbid republication of the unchanged work because that just makes it necessary for people to make some insignificant modifications as an excuse to be able to publish. So we arrive at the same four freedoms because you've got to be also free to use the work in your life as you wish. So these works must be free. A person might respond with defeatism. Well, that would be so nice in a utopia, but if we insist on defending our freedom and to use these works, nobody will write them. Or uh, they're very clever, they say, why would anyone write them as if nobody did? And then, uh, so we've got to surrender our freedom. Well, 20 years ago, we couldn't prove they were wrong. We could only, some of us, respond saying, if it doesn't respect my freedom, I don't want it. But now we can look empirically and see that people do make lots of these works. Look at all the free software, tens of thousands of applications that are useful enough to have been packaged for uh, for the Debian GNU slash Linux system. And then look at all the recipes that cooks circulate as if they were free. And then look at free reference works such as Wikipedia. And then there are even starting to be free textbooks. And if you do any work on any educational materials, insist on releasing it under a free license. Refuse to do the work otherwise. You should not contribute to non-free textbooks. Insist on adding to the free educational world. In any case, we see enough evidence to know that we shouldn't despair. We should insist on our freedom, and the works will be written, and we can write them too. So that's one category. What about the second category, works that say what certain people think? These include uh, memoirs and autobiographies, uh, essays of opinion, scientific papers, which after all are testimony of the authors. For these works, there's no need for people to have the right to publish modified versions because that's misrepresenting the thoughts of someone else. Of course, publishing a modified version is to be distinguished from quoting the material. Quoting the material is socially useful. Publishing a modified version is generally not. So it's okay to have copyright law saying you've got to get permission to publish a modified version. And that means we don't have the argument that commercial publication has to be allowed for other people. So it's okay to have copyright covering all commercial publication. So I propose a reduced copyright system that would cover all commercial use of these works and all modification. But there's a certain freedom that we must all have, and that's the freedom to share. That is, the freedom to non-commercially make and redistribute exact copies of these works. That's the minimum freedom because that's what makes copyright something we can live with once again. What makes copyright unjust and tyrannical is the attempt to stop people from sharing. This attempt is unjust in its aim because sharing is good. Sharing builds society, builds the relationships of society. Sharing must not be attacked, it must be legalized. Any law that forbids sharing is an evil law, devoid of moral authority, which deserves to be broken. And because it's so hard to stop people from sharing, the attempts to do so are cruel and destroy basic principles of justice. 
for instance, suing teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars, for instance, passing laws that punish people on accusation rather than on, uh, without giving them a trial, for instance. Now, these are, these are evil, and governments doing this show that they're the enemies of their people. So we must put an end to the war on sharing. We must legalize sharing. But for works in this category two, that's as far as we need to go. Sharing being the non-commercial redistribution of exact copies. And the rest can be covered by copyright basically as now. This reduced copyright system would provide income to the authors and artists more or less as the, what's the strange thing happening to my foot? Some kind of cramp in here, what do I have in there? It's okay now, I guess. Didn't know I could get a cramp this way. No, it's not good for me to speak sitting down. I might fall asleep. I did once. I used to say I could give these speeches in my sleep, but then I actually fell asleep once, and so now I know better. Uh, but in general, I give a better speech if I'm standing up. So, <clears throat> where was I? Was I finished with the second category or not? That's what I'm not sure of. Um, so this reduced copyright system would provide an income more or less in the same lousy way as the existing system. Okay, but yeah, okay, the third category, the art and entertainment works. For these, it was hard for me to reach a conclusion I was happy with about modification because I saw valid arguments on both sides. On the one hand, these works can have an artistic integrity and modifying them can destroy it. And if you want proof, just look and see what most of these authors allow Hollywood to do to their works, to butcher them totally. So I guess those authors didn't really have artistic integrity. But some do, some won't let Hollywood butcher their works. So I think that is a valid argument, but there are valid arguments on the other side, for instance, Consider the folk process, where a series of musicians can modify a work and produce something very rich. But then consider, if we only want to consider named, known authors, consider Shakespeare. Some of Shakespeare's plays use stories copied from other works that have been published mere decades before. Well, if today's copyright law had been in effect then, those works would have been infringing and they would not have been written. And if Shakespeare, or whoever it was who really wrote them, had complained, the copyright holders would have said, oh, don't listen to him, he just wants to make a cheap, cheap ripoff of this work, which would be no contribution to humanity. And if they had never been written, how could we have been sure that wasn't true? We couldn't have been sure. They would have been talking about a hypothetical work, which we would never see, which would never exist because of copyright law. But because copyright law then didn't work like copyright law today, uh, its primary goal being censorship after all, uh, Shakespeare or whoever it was did write them, and we can say that they're important works of literature. Eventually, I found a way to reconcile these arguments. Modifying an artistic work can be a contribution to art, but it's not super urgent. You could wait 10 years, say. Suppose copyright lasts 10 years. You could wait 10 years for the copyright to expire and then publish your modified version. And we could have requirements saying you have to modify, label it as your modified version. 
so that uh, people can look at the original, say, and compare. So we could have for 10 years the same reduced copyright system, which covers all commercial use and all modification. But everybody must be free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies, free to share. There's one other point that we have to consider, and that's remix. Taking pieces of various works and putting them together into something that overall is totally different. That has to be legal, because the only legitimate purpose of copyright law is to promote progress, meaning making more works. When copyright is interpreted in a way that makes it an obstacle to making totally new works, that means it's working against its purpose. That can only happen when corporations have distorted the system to serve them instead of serving us. So those are my recommendations for what to do with copyright law. And in particular, it means file sharing on the internet must be legal. All the measures proposed to stop file sharing are evil in their heart. They're an attempt to divide us in order to extract money out of us. But it's the greatest evil about them is not the money. The greatest evil in them is the restriction. <clears throat> so we've got to legalize music sharing. The record companies will say, that's horrible, you're stealing from the musicians. That's impossible. The record companies steal it all from the musicians. There's nothing left for us to steal. Except for long established stars, musicians don't get any money if you buy their records. Theoretically, nominally, a certain fraction of the money according to the contract is for the musicians, but the musicians never get it because the public the publicity and production expenses are treated as an advance to the musicians. They don't go to the musicians, but they're accounted as an advance. And of course, there might be some actual advance. And between those things, what you pay for the record, well, a certain share of it is nominally for musicians, but it just goes from one account in the record company to another account in the record company and it's almost unheard of for a record to sell so many copies that the musicians start to get anything. A record can go platinum, according to a sample uh, set of figures I saw, without selling enough that the musicians start to get any money when people buy it. So how do musicians get any money? not from record sales. They get a little bit from the advance, but that's not enough to live on, typically. So the way they make money is from their concerts. They, people pay to get into the concert, and they may buy stuff, too. That way, the musicians make some money, although the record companies are now worming their way into that, too. Now, this does not mean that musicians get no benefit from having a record contract. The benefit they get is that of the publicity that's done, which could mean more people coming to their concerts and more concerts and paying higher prices to come to their concerts. Well, so they get some benefit from the publicity, but this is not the only way to give musicians publicity. We can give them much healthier publicity if we get the record companies out of the equation, if we put an end to the hype industrial complex, it will be healthier for music as well. Just mailing your friend a copy is a much healthier way to give musicians publicity, and that's what we should do. And as for those record companies, what do companies deserve who have sued teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars? What do companies deserve that have purchased laws to attack our freedom? They deserve to be wiped out. They deserve to lose everything and to not just go bankrupt, but to cease to exist at all. 
I see nothing wrong with record companies as such. As long as people want to buy records, and I do, I'm glad to have record companies in existence. And if record companies had to actually pay musicians some of what they got, it might be a good thing, because right now, as I've explained, they don't. When I buy a commercial CD, which is the main way I get music, uh, I am always a little unhappy that I'm not supporting the artists. But, so, okay, so I'm not saying it's evil to be a record company, but the major record companies of today, the ones who have done those evil things, they deserve to be wiped out. They deserve to lose everything for the evil they've done. And what about movies? You've probably heard the astronomical sums cited as the cost of making movies. Could there still be movies under the system I've proposed? Well, first of all, according to a producer I spoke with, the majority of those figures is actually publicity, not making the movie at all. But even that much has been exaggerated greatly through creative accounting. So the real cost of making those movies is a lot less than what they say. Then look at the fact that a lot of use of movies is commercial use. Uh, showing them in theaters, showing them on airplanes or in trains now, in buses too, uh, broadcasting them on TV, it's commercial use. So uh, that would be covered by my proposed reduced copyright system, just as it is by the present system. Between those two, I think they could still make movies. But the other thing is, maybe instead of making things full of special effects whose main goal is to, uh, is basically suspense, they could make cheaper movies with interesting stories about people, and they might even be better. Now, it's also relevant that Hollywood systematically makes crap. Now, it's not just that, that Hollywood almost always fails to make something good. It's a system at work, and these are the results of the system. I read a book once which explained the system. The book was called Save the Cat, and its purpose its stated purpose was to teach people how to write screenplays that they could sell to Hollywood. I wasn't interested in doing that, but I found the book interesting because it was explaining the system, the system that ensures that Hollywood will almost always produce crap. Now, I am against all censorship. Censorship is an attack on human rights. Censorship of anything is an injustice. And I certainly don't want to propose censoring movies because I think they're crap. I'd be against such a proposal. But of course, no one is actually proposing that. The real proposal is for us to give up our freedom so they can keep making crap. And there I say no. If they want to make crap, uh, they can go ahead. But I'm not going to give up my freedom to help them. And you shouldn't give up yours to help them. Now, these are arguments that just legalizing sharing will not cause the sort of disaster that they will pretend it will. But just that artists will get supported more or less in the same lousy way as today is not very, uh, is not really a desirable outcome. If we appreciate the arts, we might want to support artists better than the current lousy system. So here are two proposals. One method using tax, uses tax funds. It could be a special tax, for instance, on internet connectivity, or it could be part of general revenue. It won't need to be a lot of money, you see, which is why it doesn't matter too much how we get it. The point is to spend this money, to, to, sorry, to, to, get, to transfer this money directly to artists of various kinds in proportion, well, in, in, as a function of their success, which is what copyright is supposedly doing, but not in linear proportion. 
You see, the two flaws with the existing system are, first of all, a lot of the money goes to businesses and not to the artists. Second, uh, it's distributed in an, in an inefficient way among the artists because a lot goes to a few stars and most artists get very little. And as I pointed out, uh, they don't even get a proportional amount. But really, if our goal is to support a diversity of art, and that's the logic of, behind copyright law, we can achieve that goal better <clears throat> if we distribute the money in a thoughtful way. So what I suggest is instead of linear proportion to popularity of any given artist, let's use the cube root. The cube root looks like this. So suppose star A is a thousand times as popular as fairly successful artist B. With linear proportion, A would get a thousand times as much money as B, which means that either we don't give B enough to live on or we make A tremendously rich. This is inefficient use of the money. But if we use the cube root, then A being a thousand times as popular will get 10 times as much money as B. Meaning that most of the money will go to adequately support a lot of artists who are fairly popular. And yes, each star will get more than a non-star, but not tremendously more, just somewhat more. So the result is we won't be using most of this money to make a few stars very rich, we'll be using most of the money to support fairly popular artists and a larger number of them. And that's why much less money will suffice to better support a larger number of artists. The other method that I've proposed is through voluntary payments. Suppose each player had a button you could push to send one dollar to the artists. Namely, those who made the current work or the last work played. And you could push it or not. You could push it as often as you like or not. And I think all of you could push this button once a week and you'd never notice the, the decrease in your own wallet. You wouldn't care. So why would you hesitate? In fact, I think a lot of you could probably push it once a day and not begrudge that money. It's not that much money. Of course, there are some people who can't. There are poor people who can't afford to send a dollar to some artists. And they shouldn't have to. We don't need to squeeze money out of poor people to support artists. There are enough non-poor people who will be glad to do it. In fact, there are artists who are already finding that voluntary payments support them well. Jean Sibbery put her music in her website and said, download it and pay me as much as you like. And I've read that on the average she gets more than a dollar whereas the major record companies charge a dollar. So by telling people that they can pay whatever amount they want, she gets more. <clears throat> now, there are some musicians who have various, who have websites that invite people to make voluntary payments of various different amounts, like maybe for $200 you get a fancy CD box and for $1,000, we can have dinner together, and uh, who knows what they'll do for 10,000. But of course, these are large payments. It wouldn't make sense to try to send somebody a dollar today uh, by digital methods because they're inefficient and cumbersome and they're a pain. So the change I'm proposing is make it painless. After all, why would you not send a dollar to some artists? The main reason is it's too much work. It's not because of the dollar. So if we get rid of the work, you'll give the dollar. So 
those are my proposals. Other variants can be set up. The point is that these are ways of supporting artists that are not based on trying to control who has copies. These are ways that work together with the benefits of digital technology instead of trying to take back those benefits from most of their users.